Um, dois, três, testando. Um, dois, três, um, dois, três. Ok, é, boa tarde a todos. Em nome da nossa coordenação de atividades científicas, eu gostaria de agradecer ao professor Paulo Dornelis e à professora Mariana é, pela, por ajudar a gente a organizar esse evento com é, dois pesquisadores, o Dr. Padraig e é, o Dr. Marie. Ok, é, a gente vai estar fazendo uma, uma, duas conferências presenciais são duas conferências e, ao final desse período, nós abrimos para perguntas, então eu pediria que vocês renguem e, e a gente vai abrir para conversar ao final do, do evento. Em paralelo, é, nós estamos tentando, em beta, realizar o streaming simultâneo e o armazenamento desse evento para é, no nosso canal do, do YouTube. Então, eu também sugiro que vocês acompanhem os nossos eventos dentro do, do canal do YouTube do BCCF. Bem, tendo isso dito, eu peço ao professor Paulo que faça a introdução dos nossos conferencistas de hoje. Obrigado, Fábio. É, boa tarde a todos. Bom, eu vou passar a falar em inglês daqui para frente, porque, como vocês sabem, é o, vai ser o idioma do nosso evento aqui dessa tarde. Né? Uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, uh, as you all know, uh, we have the pleasure to receive here in the Biophysics Institute of the uh, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro two knowledgeable scientists, uh, Dr. Dagnan and Dr. Van Bressen, who are uh, experts in, in marine mammals and uh, are here for, for giving uh, these lectures. The general title, I'm going to read something that I prepared because improvisation is not really my thing. So the general title for this scientific discussion here is uh, Threats to Marine Mammals in a Time of Rapid Climate Change. Uh, the idea is to have a uh, uh, 34 minutes uh, talk uh, and the, both of them, a 40 minutes talk and then uh, another 40 minutes uh, lecture. And there will not be uh, discussion in between. So all the, the questions and the discussions uh, will be after the second uh, lecture. Um, the first lecture will be given by uh, Dr. Uh, Dugnan. Uh, and its title is Emerging Diseases and Threats to Marine Mammals. The second lecture will be given by Dr. Van Bressen, and its title will be Skin Diseases in Cetaceans. Uh, we'd like to, to thank you both in advance for having accepted this, this invitation. It's very kind of you. Uh, Dr. Dugnan has worked in wildlife, a uh, 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 little introduction. introduction. Dr. Dugnan uh, has worked in wildlife disease research and diagnostics for 30 years. He has 130 peer-reviewed publications and 11 book chapters based on field and laboratory research worldwide. He is director of pathology and diagnostics of the Marine Mammal Center in Sausalito, California, and, uh, uh, which is the, the world's largest research and teaching hospital dedicated to marine mammals. Uh, his research interests include emerging infections disease and the influence of climate change on epidemiology. Uh, current research projects include uh, biotoxicosis in marine mammals, carcinogenesis in California sea lions, bacterial epidemics, 
markers for chronic stress in narwhals, uh, morbidly virus and herpes virus infection and dermatitis, dermatitis in coastal dolphins. Uh, he has supervised and mentored seven PhD graduates with uh, three ongoing, five master students and numerous honor level students, uh, externs, interns, and pathology residents. Uh, Dr. Van Bressen uh, has over, uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Van Bressen is uh, the head of the Cetacean Conservation Medicine Group at the uh, Peruvian Center for Cetacean Research and an associate scientist at uh, Pro Dolphinus, which is a not-for-profit Peruvian organization committed to the conservation of threatened and endangered, endangered marine fauna. Dr. Van Bresten has over three decades of experience uh, in diseases of cetaceans. She has worked in Europe, South America, and South Africa, and has collaborated with several research groups uh, worldwide. Her early work in Peru uh, was directed toward uh, the conservation of cetaceans, sea turtles, and other aquatic wildlife through environmental education of children. She has specialized in viral, genital, osteological, and cutaneous diseases of cetaceans. Her current projects include studies on cetacean poxivirus, uh, lobomycosis, visual health assessments in mucicets and odontocetes, odontocetes, as well as studies on mobile virus epidemics and ecological changes. She is interested in the impact of disease and anthropogenic factors on the health and conservation of cetaceans in a changing environment. Dr. Van Bressen has published over 100 scientific papers, documents, guidelines, and book chapters, and has supervised several master and PhD theses, as well as uh, ongoing postdoctoral uh, investigation. Uh, one more time, I, I would like to thank both of you for, for uh, having accepted this invitation, and yeah, the microphone Do I need the microphone? Oh, maybe I do. Thank you for the invitation to be here. And I apologize, Desculpa, I do not speak Portuguese. <laughs> I thank Mr. Google for this. So uh, I will speak in English. And I'll try and speak slowly. If you have a problem hearing or understanding me, just stick your hand up and tell me. Okay? Not moving again. We have the same problem. It's not moving. It's not moving on here. It's, it's moving here, but it's not oh. going on there. Okay, so there are a lot of there are a lot of diseases in marine mammals that could be attributed to climate change, and I'm just going to give you some examples of how climate change can impact marine mammal health, and then I will give you some specific examples for some of these things that are diseases that I've worked with or are familiar with. Okay, so uh, things that can happen is that you can have changes such that the prevalence of the pathogen changes in the environment because of something that climate has done to change where this pathogen can live or where the marine mammals can live. So you can get uh, also um, ch changes in body condition that can happen in the animals because of something that's happened in their environment and their ability to get enough uh, nutrition from the environment 
So that can cause disease, but it's directly related back to what climate did to their prey species. And then there are human-induced changes in the environment that occur because climate change has allowed this to happen. So you know, good examples are what is happening now in the Arctic because people can go there, they can do mining, they can do various extraction, they can also travel, they can have shipping routes in the Arctic where in the past this was not possible. So that's all directly related to climate change. And then there's uh, just degradation of habitat because of climate change and how that can impact on the species. So for example, the freshwater skin disease I will talk about is one example of that. But the environment and the climate, they're all very complicated things. And so it's not always a linear trajectory from where there was a, ch a change in the climate to some impact happening on the animals. Uh, it's often very complex. And one of the examples that I have here in my talk is about what's happening with the gray whales in the North Pacific. We have had two mass mortality events 20 years apart. They're probably linked with what's happening with the climate and changing in their prey, but it's a very complex system and trying to just say this is caused by that is not an easy thing to do. So it's a very complex thing and it needs a lot more research and it needs that research to be across disciplines like the one health concept where we look at health of the environment, health of the animals, health of people and how they're all interacting with each other. So we need that kind of broad approach, multidisciplinary approach of many different scientists involved. Oh, come on, please. Oh, I don't know. Sorry. Uh, mine's on this stick, so oh, yeah, oh you can. Okay. It's okay again. You can go to uh, here, do you know? It's uh, it's in uh, a specialization. I think. So it's okay. working. Okay. Uh, okay. I think it's okay now. All right. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so for the, the uh, first uh, one of these points, and that's where some change in the distribution of a pathogen has allowed something new to emerge, like climate has changed something, and a new disease appears where it never existed before. And another uh, kind of thing that can happen is where a disease already exists, but something has happened because of climate change where the epidemiology is now different. Something is different about how that disease is expressed. So the two examples I'm going to give you are examples from California. One is, the top one is a protozoal disease in California sea lions. It's called sarcocystis. It's very like toxoplasma. And then the second one is how climate changes have been changing the epidemiology of how leptospirosis, a bacterial disease, is seen in California sea lions in recent years. The uh, second, uh, the, the next example is where the uh, pathogen appears in a new environment where it didn't occur before because of climate change allowing it to happen. And the example I'm going to use here is harmful algal blooms, that's like red tide toxins, where these blooms can now happen in an area because something has happened in the climate and these uh, blooms produce toxins that get into the food chain and then cause disease in the animals. So the one I'm going to give you an example of is called domoic acid poisoning and it's from a dinoflagellate toxin uh, producing dinoflagellate. And the, the next example is where you get some uh, decline in body condition of a species 
that is directly related to what's happening in the environment because of its prey availability or changes in the prey distribution. And the example here from California is the, what's happening with the gray whales. Uh, we've had two mass mortality events in, in 20 years, and we think this is closely related to climate, if not all related to climate. And then perturbations in the environment because climate change has now allowed us humans to do something that we didn't do before. And the example that we're, I'm using here is research we're doing with narwhals in the Arctic. These are the tusked whales. And they live in the, in the northeast part of Canada, the northeast part of the Arctic, and also in Greenland. And that is an area that is now under very rapid climate change. And there's now a massive increase in shipping, mining, and all sorts of human activity. And these animals have been exposed to this in a very brief period of time, mostly in the last 10 years. So there's rapid change happening there. And we're hopefully able to document the change in these populations before too much damage is already done. Uh, and then this, the last one here is where uh, climate change is causing extreme changes uh, in coastal environments, mainly through storm activity, high precipitation. So these uh, massive storms, hurricanes, cyclones that are changing the hydrology of coastal habitats, changing the salinity for coastal dolphins and causing a, a devastating skin disease that can potentially wipe out local populations of dolphins. Back to the same problem. <laughs> so, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, does he have it already going to the lab? Yes, I'm going to do it. Okay. So that don't have to have a smoke screen? All right. Would that be okay? Sure. Because right now, I'm not sure that you will be able to do it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, we change the computer. Yeah. I think it's like. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so it's changing here, so nothing happened here because of the. Yeah, it's not changing at the. Yeah, it's not. It's not even changing here right now. <laughs> no, no. Okay, here we go again. <laughs> Can everybody understand me? Okay. So sarcocystis is a protozoal disease. It's like toxoplasmosis that you're probably all familiar with because it occurs here in Brazil, I believe. That's quite a problem. So sarcocystis is a very similar disease. And this appeared in a, one sea lion back in 2010. So this sea lion was an adult female. She came in with appeared to be muscle disease. She, they did some tests on her. They did blood work and uh, some uh, serology to look for antibodies. So the blood work showed that she had elevated enzymes fr from her muscle, so there was muscle disease. The serology showed that it was sarcocystis, serol uh, seropositive. And I think they also got a PCR positive result for uh, sarcocystis from her. Now, they treated her for that disease with medicine 
and they released her, and she seemed to be fine when they released her, but there's no follow-up, so we don't know what happened after that. But that was just one animal, and then they never saw it again, until in uh, 2016, it, it reappeared, and at this time, this is when I started working at the Marine Mammal Center, so shortly after I started, we started getting cases coming in with this disease, which had not been around for many, many years. And <clears throat> this is what it looks like. The animals, it affects the muscle. They get inflammation in the muscle. If they survive, the muscle will atrophy away, so it gets really, really thin, and they look like, like a walking skeleton. Like you're really emaciated. And it's not just loss of body fat, it's the muscle is gone. And when you take the skin off, you can see the muscle is very pale. That muscle should be really dark. See the muscle on the head here should be dark. It's really pale and really thin. And uh, even the muscles deep in the body, like the larynx. So the lar larynx muscles don't work anymore. When sea lions breathe, they have to open their larynx to breathe. And if they can't open the muscle with the muscles, they have breathing difficulties. So they will often come in, they have their breathing difficulties, it's just, not just the larynx, but it affects intercostal muscles, the uh, sternum, the uh, diaphragm, all of these muscles are affected. So they will appear like they have pneumonia, but it's really, it's a muscle disease. And, um, there's the diaphragm. So that's the diaphragm held up. You should not be able to see right through the diaphragm of a sea lion. It should be almost two centimeters thick, solid muscle. And this is like, like paper. So you can see through it, this muscle is not working for respiration. Oops, the wrong way. Those are the muscles of the chest wall. And you can see the dark color is the normal muscle color, but all those white streaks, that's where the muscle cells are dead. And it also affects the, the muscle in the uh, esophagus is striated muscle. It's like in a dog. So when a dog swallows, it's active swallowing all the way down. Not like us, we just swallow and it goes down. But in, in a dog or a sea lion, they, have, they can actively swallow. And if they can't actively swallow, then their esophagus will just fill up with food and they can't swallow and they regurgitate. So they will slowly so starve to death as well. So the dotted line shows you where the esophagus is and it is very, very big. It shouldn't be much bigger than you can see the aorta, but it's really dilated. And when it's opened up, you can see it's just full of food that cannot get down into the stomach. And the, the muscle in the wall of that esophagus is gone. It's just all atrophied away. And this is what the muscle looks like. So uh, some of these fibers are normal. The pink ones are necrotic. They're dying. And these blue ones with all of these nuclei, they're regenerating. So you have everything from normal to acute necrosis to more chronic regeneration. So we call this polyphasic, more than one phase. So if you uh, kill muscle like with a toxin, with a one hit of a toxin, that's like a single uniphasic event. If this, this event is going on multiple times, so it, at any point in time, you have acute necrosis, you have regeneration, and then you still have some normal muscle. So it's ongoing repeated. And we also are able to characterize the type of inflammatory cells that are in here. So there's some in, uh, some in there. These are lymphocytes. So the cells that are in here are mainly lymphocytes with some macrophages. That is inflammation that's more typical of chronic and immune-mediated inflammation. So this is acting like an immune-mediated disease. It's not like it, acting like a normal parasite-induced inflammation, which would be more neutrophils and eosinophils and granulocytes. This is more immune mediated. And that's the parasite. So that's Sarcocystis neurona. It, now this is a mature cyst. This is not the one that's actually really causing a problem. It's these little guys here when they are free in the muscle that are really causing the problem. This is a mature cyst. But when you do immunohistochemistry for the parasite, 
Here's some in a cyst, but you can see within the muscle fiber, all of these little uh, brown dots, these are all the rapidly dividing sarcocystis gisons in the muscle. Now, the life cycle of sarcocystis, if, you, if you're familiar with toxoplasma, you know what sarcocystis is. The only difference is that instead of a cat, you've got an opossum, a marsupial. Now, in California, these are not native species. They are from the eastern part of North America, but they were brought to the western part, and they brought this parasite with them. But it's been in California a long time, and we've known that sarcocystis can cause encephalitis in seals, in uh, sea otters and other species, even dolphins, but it's not known to cause this muscle disease in anything else other than sea lions. So the life cycle, as you can see, the possum uh, passes out these uh, cysts, they get into the environment, they get taken up by another host. It's a big problem in horses, where it gets into the spinal cord and causes that disease in, in, uh, in horses. But if it gets into the water, into the fresh water, and then into the marine water, it can get into sea otters and sea lions and dolphins and everything else. And usually, as I said, it causes encephalitis, but in the sea lion, it's the muscle disease. So since uh, 2016, uh, when it reappeared, this disease it's, uh, really appeared for the first time because it was only one case in 2010. So we saw those cases in 2016 and then more in 2017. So really a sharp increase in cases. And ever since that, we have seen a steady number of cases. But based on these first ones here, we did some research on those. And we published some papers. We published this paper on the uh, pathology of it. And that's where we uh, documented that it was more like an autoimmune disease than just a straight parasitic infection. And then we also published this one on the clinical signs. So I mentioned how some have got the respiratory signs, some will have the problem with the esophagus and they present like uh, with just with that, and others where it's more generalized, so all the muscles are affected. So it can be very confusing for the clinical people to figure out what's going on. Okay, so when we had this, we had the hypothesis, we knew it was, it was sarcocystis involved, but we, since we'd never seen this disease before, really, we thought maybe it's a new strain. And the reason for that was that just around the same time, this novel strain of sarcocystis was reported for the Pacific Northwest, so north of California, but it was a different strain, uh, but mainly causing encephalitis, not causing the muscle. But because there was a novel strain found, we thought maybe there's another novel strain in our California sea lions. Uh, so, we uh, talked to some people who work at the uh, NIH, the National Institute of Health, who work with like, protozo protozoal diseases, and asked them to do some genetic characterization on our animals. But what they found was that we did not have a new strain. We had the two strains that were already very common circulating in North America. So, it wasn't a new strain. And then, so the question was, uh, how are they getting exposed to this, even if it's one of the common strains? Well, again, we go back to what we know about it in other species. So in sea otters, sarcocystis was already known for many years to be a cause of encephalitis. And they were able to look at the epidemiology and see that the cases usually occurred in the springtime after the, the winter rain. So you get all this rain washing all these uh, cysts into the water locally, and then it gets into the food chain through the uh, bivalves and other filter feeding organisms and works its way up through the food chain. And that's how the sea otters get it. So we thought it's probably a pretty similar model. Um, so we knew that. Uh, but what else happened in the environment? Why did it suddenly appear in 2016, 15, 16? Well, why not before this? If it was already in otters for 20 years, why was it not in sea lions? So what did happen then? But what we do know is that this uh, blob event, which was a thermal anomaly, they call it, of the North Pacific, where you've got 
this body of warm water forming out to the west. So here's California, or there's Canada, there's Vancouver Island, California is down here. This body of warm water formed out in the North Pacific and expanded towards the coast. So normally the water along here should be the Alaska current and really cold water all the way down to California. And instead, in, in uh, 2015 and extending for a couple of years, it became this really warm water and it changed the whole uh, dynamics of the North Pacific ecosystem. The whole food chain changed very rapidly. So um, could that have had something to do with the emergence of, of this disease? We don't know, but it, it's uh, suggestive. So the next disease also affecting California sea lions is leptospirosis. And again, leptospirosis has been around for a long time. We've known about leptospirosis in sea lions since the 1940s. So it's a long time. And we know a lot about its epidemiology. It's, uh, there's only one serovar in California sea lions, Pomona. And all of the isolates have been that almost exclusively. And we've known that since the 70s. But what happened in recent years was a phenomenon that had never been seen before, which is called fade out. So that means that for some reason, this dis disease just disappeared completely, could not be detected. So what happened to do, to do that? And what, hap what made it reappear? And then what it, when it did reappear, the pathology was different. So it's yeah, really unusual. Okay, so if you don't know what it does, and apologies if you don't like pathology, <laughs> there's some uh, body parts here. Okay, that is a normal California sea lion kidney. It's made up of separate little units. Each one of these is a separate kidney. So here you've got a cortex, a medulla, and a pelvis. And that's repeated over and over again. That's a normal one. This is a d uh, diseased kidney, so the uh, cortex here is expanded, and it's really pale. And it's pale because white blood cells have infiltrated in there for the inflammation. And below the cortex, you have the cortical medullary junction here. It's really red and hemorrhagic. And then there's your pelvis. There's also some hemorrhage there. So we, we, it goes from this to this. And once we see this in the lab, we know pretty well, almost 100%, this is going to be leptospirosis. And we, under the microscope, these are tubules. These are all tubules. You get necrosis of the tubule epithelium, so all of this pink smudgy stuff are dead tubule cells. And if you stain it spe with silver stain, you can see these are the leptospira. And if you do immunohistochemistry just for lepto leptospiral detecting antigen, all of the red is where the leptospiral antigen is. So it's all in the tubules, it's not in the glomeruli. Okay, so that, this is all stuff that was known. We've known this forever. It's been around for a long time. But when it reappeared after that period of no disease, uh, what we saw was that all of this stuff is still here, but now we have all of these other diseases affecting uh, other uh, parts of the gastrointestinal system, the, uh, the lungs, the skin, and the brain. These were things that had never been described before. So first seen in this last big epidemic we had. So you've got all of these ulcers in the mouth, the gums, the lips, the tongue, in the stomach causing uh, bleeding. These are all bleeding ulcers. Uh, that's a blood clot in the stomach where it's bled out into its stomach. And the skin disease, like these ulcers on the skin. And in the lungs, you get severe uh, pulmonary edema, and then you can get bacterial infection on top of that, and they can often die from pneumonia. And that's just a section of the lung showing this edema all through the lung. Okay, so the interesting thing from, for the climate point of view is, is this fade-out phenomenon. So, as I said, it's been around for a long time, and it's been studied intensively since the early, really the 1970s. But since the 19, early 1980s, there's been these seasonal peaks of occurrence, and then a, a period with no disease, and then it'll come back again. So every three to four years, you get these cycles. 
And the, but what happened in the fade out was that uh, a big study had actually started with UCLA and Katie Prager's group. And they had actually started this study in 2012. And in 2011, there was a big epidemic. So they started their research in 2012 to look at the epidemiology. And then there was no disease until 2017. So they were left with this big grant and they had no disease to study. But it was actually very fortunate because they put a lot of effort into trying to work out, well, what did happen? Where did it go? So they, they did a lot of studies with uh, free-ranging animals, looking at the prevalence, seroprevalence, and PCR prevalence in free-ranging animals in different co uh, colonies along the coast. And they also worked with uh, the stranded animals we had, doing serology and doing PCR on kidneys over that time. And then all the pups that they were born between 2013 and 2016 were all seronegative, which meant that their mothers did not have antibodies. So they were not, mothers were not transferring antibodies to their pups, which meant the mothers weren't infected and they weren't protecting their pups. And then there was a small outbreak happened in 2017, and then we got a huge one in 2018. Those photos I showed you f were from that. And this is, this is that pattern. So you can see from early 80s, every few years, there's a big epidemic. And in between, there's maybe little small outbreaks. Then 2011, that was that big outbreak. 2012, just a little bit. And then there was nothing for several years, nothing, nothing at all. And then it reappeared in 2017. Uh, there was one case in 2016, 2017, and then the big epidemic in 2018. And here we are now in 2022, and there's another uh, one of these happening. So we're here, and it'll pro next year we'll probably be up there again. Okay, so the hypothesis is, again, coming back to that thermal anomaly that happened in the North Pacific. So as I said, it changed the whole food chain. It changed everything where the, the prey fish were. It changed where the sea lions were foraging. It completely changed the dynamics. And one of the things that this group in UCLA found was that the maintenance of leptospirosis in the population is very dependent on the movement of the sea lions. So the older animals in the population will often be chronic carriers of disease. And they, they will be the, the maintainers of it. And when the sea lions go to breed in the southern part of California, it's the older animals down there will have it. And then as the pups that are born down there get older, they migrate up the coast. And in the past, or in the nor normal situation, they would pick up infection as they migrate north. And some of them will get severe infection and die, but others won't. But you'll get that cycle of enough susceptibles coming into the population to maintain it and to have epidemics every few years. So something happened in that interval between 20 12 and 2017 to break that cycle of normal sea lion migration and contact. So that was probably this blob event. Now there's a lot of detail that's gone into this research. I don't have time to go into all of it, but if you look up the work of Katie Prager and these people at UCLA, they, we collaborate with them. They have published a lot of work on this and we'll be publishing a lot more. And that's, uh, that was the first of those thermal events. This was the one that started in, in 2014 and continued through 15, 16. And then this is another one that happened in 2019. So there's at least been two of these in the last decade. Okay, so a, a new, this is an example of a disease where it has occurred now in an area where it never had before and in a time when climate change is already happening. So this disease, domoic acid, it is a toxin. It's produced by a dinoflagellate organism, like a plankton organism. It was never seen in California, in, in California sea lions before 1998. That was the very first time it caused disease in that species in that area. And that species have, and that area has been monitored for you know, much longer than the 1990s. So it would, if it had been around, it would have been detected. So it appeared for the first time in 1998. And there's been many, many publications on it now since that. Um, so 
uh, how is the epidemiology of this involved with climate? So as I said, the first one was 1998, and now, well, retrospective uh, analysis showed that maybe there were two other events prior to that. But over this uh, last two decades, we certainly have seen a lot of it. So usually it's, it's in the summer or autumn, you know, the warmer months of the year. But since 2014, we've had more and more of these. So it's almost like instead of every few years, now it's every year. And in some years we see it not just in the summer and the fall, but throughout the year. And again, with the leptospirosis, as I said, we're having an epidemic of that right now. We're also having an outbreak of domoic acid poisoning right now. So things are busy back where I come from. So again, is this related to the climate and marine thermal events? It, it, uh, it probably is. So that shows you some of the, the, the graphs of uh, various years. So this, this is 98 when it first appeared, 2000, up to 2000. So the first 10 years, it was sort of every few years. It wasn't you know, every single year, and there weren't massive events. And then since that, since 2014 up to until right now really, and during these years when we've had these thermal anomalies, we have seen bigger events and they're more spread out in time. So they'll start earlier and they'll go for longer. In 2015, the, um, when that thermal anomaly was at its peak, we had domoic acid outbreaks happening from Southern California all the way to Alaska. So that was unprecedented. And again, that just shows, uh, this is 98, and then next big one was 2000, 2000 and then not till 2004, 2009, but in recent years, they seem to be just coming closer and closer and bigger and bigger. And those are where the thermal anomalies were. Okay, so the pathology of this disease, it, it's a biotoxin that is a neurotoxin. It's a glutamate receptor antagonist. So anywhere in the body where you have glutamate receptors in the brain, in your heart, but also in kidneys and other places, that's where you can find pathology. And it, it's actually unusual. It's one of these toxins where you actually can see pathology associated with it. There are other toxins where you don't see anything. This, this one you do. So the animals will present often with you know, neurologically abnormal, uh, obtunded, depressed. Uh, they'll often have seizures erratic behavior, they can be super aggressive. So lo lots of different changes in behavior. And that's because the brain is affected. So the, the target organ is, is mostly the brain and mostly the limbic system and the hippocampus. So this is the ventral hippocampus. This is uh, the dentate gyrus. And this is Ammon's horn or the cornu aminus. And these areas are, are particularly affected now, if I go higher power on that, in an acute case, all of these, or these pink neurons are dead neurons. Uh, by com that's a normal neuron right there. That's a normal neuron there. These, these ones with the arrows, these are all dead or dying. So this is an acute case of domoic acid poisoning. Now, the result of that would be that all of those neurons will disappear and also a lot of the glial cells, astrocytes, and other cells too. So all of that will contract down like a scar if the animal lives. They'll often die at this stage. And, in the more, and so in, if they live and they get that chronic <coughs> effect, then you can see that on an MRI. So compared to this, that side to this side, there's atrophy here that uh, can be seen on imaging in a live animal. And if you do, a, uh, th that animal died. So this is a section through the brain at that point. So here's your cerebral hemispheres. This is the corpus callosum. This is the dorsal part of the hippocampus. And this is the ventral part of the hippocampus. That's the thalamus. Now, you can see there's a big difference between that side and that side. And it's often asymmetric like that. We don't know why, because it travels in the blood. Why should one side be affected and the other one not? We don't know. Uh, but you can see there are big holes here in this brain at that point, but not on this side. So this is because the ventricle is actually expanded because the hippocampus is atrophied. 
So that is all atrophied down. It should look like that. Okay, and it's now looking like that. It also affects the, uh, the heart, as I said. So animals with the cardiac failure that will happen because of that, they'll often present with an abdomen full of fluid, ascites fluid. Um, a normal heart should look like this. this is a sea otter. This is a, a DA heart. It's brown and discolored. Here's another sea otter. That's actually the same animal here. So this heart is big and, and rounded, square, very pale. And see all the edema fluid in the lungs, all of these gray lines in the lung. This is all edema fluid from the lungs because the heart is failing. And you'll also get that in the liver, and then the fluid will leak out into the abdomen. But if you do staining on the cardiac muscle, all of this blue is fibrosis that's replacing normal cardiocytes that have been killed by the toxin. All right, so now we're on to another example. So this is where climate has changed something in the dynamics of the ecosystem. So affected the prey of the, the animal, of the, of the host animal, and caused poor body condition and causing mortality. So the gray whale is a really good example of that because most of these animals that we have seen in two, two UMEs or unusual mortality events present like this in very poor body condition and covered in ectoparasites. You can see all of the, this yellowy stuff here. This is all sea lice. It's got a huge burden of, of parasites on it. Okay, so the gray whale, it migrates between Alaska, the Arctic, and Mexico. It's the longest migration of any mammal. They do that. They spend the summer up here feeding. They spend the winter down here giving birth, mating, and then they migrate back again. And all of our mortality in the two UME events have happened on the northern migration as they're going back from, usually from uh, March through May or June is when we see the mortality. And as I said, we've had, the, this is the normal pattern of mortality. In 1999 and 2000, we had two events. There's the other one. Uh, so this one and this one each of those killed about a quarter of the population. So about 24, 25% of the whole population died during those events. So we've only just finished having this one, and we still haven't all the data analyzed, but the findings between the two are pretty similar. So as I said, they, they often die in very poor body condition, lots of parasites on them, huge decrease in the numbers in the population, so in this last UME, which started maybe April 2019 and went through to uh, June of this year, we had almost 600 dead whales on the West Coast. And these are the stats from this 19 to 22 period. And you can see the peak of mortalities here, kind of in March, April, May. And that's when they're migrating past California to get back up to Alaska. So as I said, often covered in parasites, so chronic uh, wasting, poor body condition to end up covered in parasites like that. Here's another example of a subadult male. So with these, along with the uh, just gross examination and finding that, that emaciation, we do histology on the blubber layer. So this is the, the most superficial blubber layer, the inner, the middle blubber, and then the deeper blubber. So each of these layers should have way more fat cells than they do. This one uh, has 60% has adipose left. This, one, this area is 50% and that's just 25. So it's not the worst one we've seen, but it's, it's an example of what we are seeing. Okay, so what we have found that th there's no single cause of death. Some of these whales you can say died from emaciation because they're so thin, but others are thin, but they've been struck by a ship or something, and they died because of the trauma caused by the ship. But they were already in poor body condition. And then uh, for some others are entangled. But for the most part, they're all in poor body condition. That, so that's sort of the single common denominator. We've not been able to find any pathogens. We have found some biotoxins, but either undetectable, 
low levels are moderate, but we don't even know the significance of that because there's, there's, no, there's no pathology to go along with it. Okay, so some of the environmental things that are, are happening is that uh, th there's a, a big study that's just been published, if you're interested, this one here by Sue Moore, who works for NOAA. They published a paper this year on what's happening at the feeding grounds in the Arctic. And this is just one example from her paper. So this area here is one of the major feeding grounds for gray whales in the Bering Sea. The other areas are up here in the Chukchi Sea. But this area in the Bering Sea, they were able to do studies on the benthic amphipods and, and other a a organisms that the whales feed on. And you can see here from 2010 through 2019, there was a massive decrease or complete absence of some of these benthic fauna. So in, in for this one here, by 2016, they're gone. And for here, by 2012, they're not detectable anymore. So massive change in the ecosystem in that part, which has been the most impacted by climate change. It has had the most severe uh, loss of sea ice cover in the winter time. Okay, so with all, there's a lot more detail in her paper, so if you want to go there, you can see that. But that's a statement that they, they made, basically saying that, okay, climate change could have caused this change in the benthic fauna and the food availability of the whales, but there could also have been an effect of just carrying capacity for the species, that they had reached at 27,000 in the population. They have reached carrying capacity for the environment, when they get to that much, they eat themselves out of food, and then they die, and then the cycle happens over again. So it could be, it could be that or climate change, or it could be a combination of the two. And we just have to do more work on that. Okay, so sticking with the Arctic, uh, this is a project that I got involved with maybe 10 years ago now. I have a PhD student working on, on narwhals, and the idea was to try and get some, not necessarily a baseline, because 10 years ago, it was not even baseline in the Arctic anymore. There was already two or three decades of climate change up there. So you were getting uh, like a point in time uh, benchmark rather than a baseline. So the idea was to get a benchmark of where we were at with health and disease in narwhals. And if we could come up with some markers of stress or health that would not be invasive. And also that would involve the community because uh, the native Inuit com community, because they depend on narwhals for food and they hunt narwhals. They are very interested and invested in knowing what is wrong with the narwhals. They, they want to know and they want to help with the science. So th the idea was to come up with science that they're involved in and can help with. So, the narwhal, as I said, lives uh, in the northeast part of Canada. So here's, this is Baffin Island. Uh, Hudson Bay will be down there. This is Greenland. So this area is the Greenland Strait. And that's where the, the narwhals spend their summer months. So uh, there's often open water here. That's where they live in the summertime, in, or sorry, the wintertime where there's open water. In the summertime when the ice melts back, they're able to go up into these fjords, and this is where they have their calves and where they re rear the calves over the summer months. So that's where they spend the summer. And our field work starts in Pond Inlet. It's a little town in Baffin Island on the north coast. And then we go through these sounds and end up in here in one of these little fjords. So as I said, uh, very important for the Inuit people for food security and also for the people of, of Greenland. Uh, so, like, you know, these are the people we work with in the field. This is a you know, family that still hunt using traditional methods. They use harpoons, they use seal skin floats, they use kayaks, all this kind of thing. Um, so there's the har harpoon with the float, um, the harpoon head. But most of them hunt now using rifles and guns, and they stand up on the cliffs here, and the whales swim past like this and then they shoot or shoot them from the shore and then they, they harvest them. So the threats to narwhal are climate change, loss of the sea ice. They are an ice obligate species. They need the ice. 
And if you've ever wondered why narwhals don't have a dorsal fin, it's because they swim under the ice and a dorsal fin would get in the way. And for forever, predators like killer whales with the big dorsal fin can't go after them, so they're safe from killer whales. That's changing. So there's a, a lot of things happening there, and also all of this human activity now that can happen because there's less ice. The ice melts earlier in the spring, and there's a longer period in the summer where there's no ice. It doesn't form until later, and each for at each end of the, of the season, there's a month added on with no ice that never happened you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. There's also a growing human population up there because there's more resource extraction, there's mining and all these activities that never happened before, so there's more people up there. There's also a lot more tourists, and also the killer whales are now there where they never were before. So killer whales are a big problem too. Uh, the, the whole population in, in the Eclipse Sound where we do the work is declining and they're shifting further north into other areas. And the, the change in this is rapid. I mean, I've seen it and I've only been working there for 10 years, so it's, it's really, really fast. So one of the big changes now is that you can have ships going all the way from the Pacific, container ships, all the way across the Arctic to get to Europe. They no longer have to go through the Panama Canal. They can go right through the Arctic in the summer months, and they're doing that already. The other thing in, our, in the area that we're doing the research, so, that, so Pond Inlet, where we do the work from, is here. So this red dot is showing uh, the Mary River iron ore mine. That only opened in 2014. And now that is bringing in a huge number of ships into this fjord where the whales are. The fjord is very... It's maybe a kilometer across. It's long, but it's very narrow and deep. And that's where the whales come to have their calves and to feed and spend the summer months. Now there are ships constantly going in and out of this fjord. The good thing was that the Inuit people objected to what was happening. The mine wanted to expand and do even more work right all year round through the winter to br bring in icebreakers and to actually break the ice in the fjord in the wintertime. And luckily, the Inuit people said, no, you're not doing that. So that's not happening. Now, the other big thing is killer whales. And they are having a massive impact on, on, uh, on narwhal. And this paper here estimates that between 1,000 and 1,500 a year are being killed by killer whales, when there was never any killer whales there. They were never in that area. Okay, there's Sandy, so we're doing a, a, a necro. These are whales that the, the hunters have harvested, and then we collect samples after they've taken the, the meat and the tissues and whatever else they want. And th just a couple of examples. One of the things we found that we didn't expect to find in that first year where we're up there, we only did eight necropsies, but three of these animals had cancer. We weren't expecting that. So that was one of the ones that had cancer. So this is... Uh, his lung with a big uh, cancer tumor in it, and that's what it was, it was a chondroma. And then this is an adult female, and she had this tumor on her intestine, and that turned out to be a, a, a smooth muscle tumor, a leiomyoma. So these are uh, smooth muscle cells, and that's uh, stained with actin stain to show that it is smooth muscle. And the, oh, shoot. The pre, oh, no. The previous one, uh, that one is uh, cytokeratin showing it's not an epithelial cell, so it is a muscle cell. And then another one had this tumor, which is a, a lipoma in its adrenal gland. Okay, so what we're doing about the stress markers is we're looking at collaborating with different people to do like uh, microbiome work. We're doing uh, skin proteomes, uh, we're doing assays for steroids using uh, skin um, biopsies and samples from the skin that the hunters have collected that are for their food consumption. And hopefully by next year we should have answers for all of this when uh, Sandy finishes her PhD. But we have already had pretty good promising results showing we're using 
two groups of animals were using chronically stressed narwhals that were trapped in ice for several months. This is a natural phenomenon that happens, but then they were harvested by the Inuit and we got samples from those versus animals that are, uh, so they were our chronic stress animals. And then we've got other ones from years ago, like decades old, that are like archived from a time when global warming wasn't such a problem. Okay, the last thing I'm going to do is freshwater skin disease. And this is a, this is sort of a, this is from a paper that I presented at the World, uh, the Biennial Marine Mammal Conference that was in Florida last month. Uh, this again is something that has emerged just in really the last uh, two, three decades. It was first seen in the 1990s. Was it recognized back then what it was? And it was just very recently that we got a good handle on what's happening. So we wrote a pa this paper here that was published in 2020 from cases we saw in Australia. And it's based on the pathology, the environmental factors, and, and using that to put a story together on what causes it. Okay, so the places that, I used to be uh, a professor at the University of Melbourne, so that's how I was working in Australia. And while I was there, we had an outbreak of this disease in Eastern Australia in the Gippsland Lakes. So this is, uh, you know, kind of like the, the habitat you were showing me yesterday here at Sebatiba Bay. Uh, so you've got these sand barriers and then you've got these waterways fed by rivers coming from the land, so it's bringing in a lot of fresh water. And then the other area is over here. Again, you've got two major rivers, the Swan and the Canning, both draining into the ocean near Perth. And again, there's a big waterway that they, they, the dolphins live in. This, uh, it's almost like a, a massive big lagoon area. And the two species were Terceopsidunkus, the Indo-Pacific uh, bottlenose dolphin, and the uh, Terceops australis, a newly identified species of Terceops that only occurs in this part of Australia. Now this is a pretty horrible disease. Uh, these dolphins will die with the most awful skin disease. You get these ulcers over 70, 80% of the body. And they, it's a chronic condition that goes on for uh, weeks to months. They'll often get all of these algae and fungi growing on the body surface just because they're so debilitated. And, but the cause of that can often be just sepsis or dehydration uh, failure to eat. Uh, the dehydration, because if you have that m much ulceration over your body, it's like if you've been burnt in a fire and lost all your skin, like third degree burns, you will die from losing all your body fluid and, and shock from that. So these animals are, are dying like that. And to explain how it's happening pathologically, so here's normal dolphin skin. You've got your dermis down here, dermal papillae, and then the epidermis. And the dark line of cells in here, these are the germinal cells that are producing the epidermis. So you've got a very deep column of cells being produced by this germinal layer. Now, if you add water to that, and there's some breach in this outer layer of the epidermis, then the fresh water, sweet water, can get in here. The cells in here will take it up inside them, and they'll swell and eventually they'll burst. And when they do, they, they result in these vesicles forming. First of all, swollen cells, and then these vesicles forming within the epidermis. Now, that will kind of migrate out towards the surface and erupt on the surface. That's one way of getting those lesions. And the other is if the animal becomes septic, so it's got bacteria circulating in its body, and th those bacteria settle out in these small blood vessels at the dermal epidermal junction where there's very fine little blood vessels. They form little abscesses here, micro abscesses, that then will migrate, uh, get bigger and bigger and migrate out towards the surface and eventually again, these will form big crater-like ulcers on the, on the skin surface. So that's just two possible mechanisms for how those lesions appear. Now, to get to the environmental part of it, we were very fortunate for both of these places because in both areas, the dolphin populations were well studied, they were well known, they knew the individuals, they had you know, fin identification on, on them, they knew who the individuals were, and they had that for many years. Now, they also had 
environmental monitoring at both places where there were monitors in the water measuring salinity, temperature, oxygen, you know, all of these variables in both places and at multiple sites. So it wasn't just at one place and also at, multi at the surface and deeper down in the water column. So there was a lot of environmental data. And luckily we had that from before these events happened, during and after. So we had a lot of environmental data to work with. So for uh, it, the Gippsland Lakes area in Victoria, what happened there was that this, is, uh, this was a normal pattern for many years. Then uh, for a 10 year period prior to the outbreak of this disease, there was a drought, which meant that the rivers feeding into those lagoons were, there was much less fresh water coming in, so the salinity went high. The salinity went up to 35 parts per thousand, which is like seawater. So the dolphins were living in basically seawater for 10 years. And then all of a sudden, the drought broke, the rain happened, and the area flooded. All of a sudden, it becomes a freshwater lake. And now they're living in water that's less than five parts per thousand. And that happened in a very short space of time. And the very same thing happened in 2020, where you, all this blue and green is high rainfall. That happened again prior to another outbreak of this event. And in Western Australia, so this is Perth, this is the Swan River and the Canning River. Um, these three color points are these charts for salinity. So that's showing, okay, so this is 35 parts per thousand. That's like full strength seawater going along, along, along. All of a sudden, boom, it's down less than five parts per thousand and it stays down for, for weeks to months and the dolphins start getting sick and then the, the mortality starts happening here. Now going back, as I said, there was records going back for years. So we were able to go back and look at all the records and you can see, it's hard to read that, but this goes back for 20 years. And you can see, so every, uh, every few years, every, actually every single year, there's a, this change of, because of the rains happen in the winter and spring, you always get a drop in salinity, but never, uh, almost never as bad as causing this. But we did see it, in, so this is 2009 when we had this event. 2007 they had also some with mortality and 2003 they had some with mortality. So it has happened before. And that just shows another profile of the water. So this is upstream, this is the ocean down here. So the brown water is fresh water or sweet water. The blue is high salinity water. So you can see this is June, August, August, September, October, November. So starting in June, you start getting fresh water coming down river, almost down to the ocean, almost down to the ocean, and all the way down to the ocean by September. And then that's when the disease broke out in, in October. Now this isn't limited to Australia. These are all places where something similar has been seen. Now Marie is going to tell you about some examples from South America. I'm just going to mention uh, Gulf of Mexico because that, that has become really the hot spot for this disease. And, and mainly because of the Mississippi River and mainly because of what humans did to the Mississippi River. So it's no longer a natural outflow, or it normally had a delta where all of these uh, uh, would have been tributaries draining water out into the Gulf. Human engineers came along and made this one channel out here, and then they built spillways and really changed the way the water flows. So in 2019, there was a big event where all of this fresh water poured out into these bays from Lake Pontchartrain, and over 300 dolphins died in this area. And now the Army Corps of Engineers are going to make changes to turn this back into a, a normal system the way it used to be. And instead of this one channel for the Mississippi coming through here, they're going to have fresh water run off into these bays here that are either side. And those two places, Barataria Bay and Breton Sound, already have big populations of dolphins. Their habitat will now be flooded with fresh water, so they will probably all die. So that is coming in the next 
couple of years. That is one of the dolphins from the Mississippi from 2019. And also along with that, you've got all of these storm and hurricane events, and they're getting bigger and worse, so they're all dumping fresh water, creating more runoff, so yeah, it's not a good story. Okay, so as I said, it can be defined by the gross pathology, the histopathology, the association with the environmental factors, and I'm calling this an emerging disease because I think we are going to see a lot more of it in many places. And thank you for your attention. I'm sorry for taking so long with the computer and everything. And ready to hand over to Marie. So hello, everybody, and thank you for um, inviting me to give this talk today. Um, um, I'm specifically going to speak about skin diseases in a time of rapid um, environmental changes. Um, and so briefly, I, I will talk about uh, how it started with skin disease incitation. They have been, they were reported, uh, they have been reported since the 1950s in mostly in dolphins uh, and it was um, especially the so lobomycosis, tattoo skin disease, abscesses and the eryz erysipelas. Um, the first one was considered an aesthetic and when a dolphin was caught for captivity it was released because it was not very nice to see. The second one, tattoo skin disease, you can see these small lesions, they were um, found to be caused by pox viruses uh, in the 70s. And these two were dangerous for the dolphin as if left untreated, they were, the dolphin w would die. So you have to treat them with antibiotic. But until the 90s, they were not of a particular interest to scientists. And but in the, um, with uh, the outbreaks of mobilivirus uh, epidemics in striped dolphins in the 90s. So the interest for uh, skin disease and health of the dolphins and porpoises increased and uh, a growing number of vets started to dedicate the, their studies to uh, marine mammal health. They were considered as uh, important health indicator in cetacean population and communities and some conditions are status skin disease and lobomycosis are easily recognizable in the field. So it was quite a good system to um, investigate the uh, health of uh, cetaceans, but also maybe of their environment. And with the rapid climate change, of course, uh, there were more and more studies on this topic. So there are several skin diseases that are thought to be linked with environmental changes, but as Porek said, it's difficult really to demonstrate that this skin disease is linked to that. But um, I will try to, to speak about some of them that for which we have more data. So uh, besides lobomycosis and tattoo skin disease, there is also this um, focal skin disease in Chile, in a, in a reserve that has been affected by aquaculture. Uh, these uh, sun damaged uh, cutaneous lesions in, in whales, that has been documented by Martinez Levasseur in 2010, and you can see these small nodules on the skin that have been caused by, uh, by sun damage. 
And then also in Chile, we found that several calves in the population were affected by these large whitish uh, lesions. But for, for them, we don't have an etiology. So I start about um, with lobomycosis. So lobomycosis is characterized by granulomatosis lesions that may ulcerate and form large plaques, like you can see, oops, sorry. So in, in this case, um, the disease never regresses um, in, in the wild. And the lesions can affect the dorsal fin, the head, the, the tail, and the flank pretty well everywhere on the body. And it can, be, it can cover a large uh, part of the visible body. So uh, the granulomas uh, go deep into the dermis, and they are composed of multinucleated cells giant cells, uh, macrophage, lymphocytes, plasma cells, that, um, and his uh, structure, like those you can see here. That was a paper published by Rothstein uh, in offshore bottlenose dolphin. The etiological agent is paracoxidoides CTE. It was thought so that uh, it was loboa, uh, lacasia loboi, but it's another um, yeast. It belongs to the order Onigonigenal, and it's not possible to cultivate it, it, at least until now. And lobomycosis like disease has a clinical presentation very similar to lobomycosis, but it was only observed in the wild, and uh, there was no histology to confirm. However, in some cases, uh, one of these dolphins stranded and was examined by histology and molecular techniques, and uh, the, the yeast was found in these dolphins. So this confirms that also you can, um, you can make a, a good diagnosis uh, on with dolphins that have been seen uh, in the field. So the disease uh, may last four years, and so we have seen dolphins with these conditions for a long time, but they eventually died, and during a study, uh, that examined the, ca the cases uh, from the 70 to uh, 2018, uh, 29 dolphins had died, and we estimate that in 21 dolphins affected with this disease, the rate of mortality was 19%. Uh, um, it's most often found in, uh, in older dolphins. For example, in Florida, it's uh, mostly found in dolphin that are uh, older than 20 years, but calves may also be infected. Transmission is thought to be horizontal uh, through small epidermal traumas. And what we found also in the dolphins from Guayaquil in Ecuador is that the association with positive uh, male is a risk factor. And in a community when the, high, the, the dominant male is affected, the community is mostly uh, affected by the, do, the, the, the disease too, with sometimes 40% of the community infected by lobomycosis. Uh, studies in, uh, in Florida have shown that uh, impaired adaptive immunity, likely caused by exposure to uh, PCBs and mercury may predispose uh, dolphins to the infection. So these are all the studies, no, not all, but some of the studies um, that have examined uh, lobomycosis and lobomycosis-like disease in, uh, in the dolphins. So just to s uh, ab something about the geographic and biological expansion of the disease. So this was um, uh, what we had, uh, what we had um, in the in the nineties. So you you had cases in common bottlenose dolphin from Florida, uh, a, a Guyana dolphin from Suriname, and a common bottlenose dolphin from the Gulf of Gascony in in Europe. Then after some time, some, uh, a case was reported in Laguna in Brazil, also in a common bottlenose dolphin and in Texas. But then over the course of time, 
the number of cases increased too. And sometimes in regions that had been um, studied for a long time. So it's not just because they started looking at the dolphins that they found the disease. No, these dolphins had been studied for a long time. And they found an uh, image of dolphins with lobomycosis. So um, there were much more cases also in Florida. They discovered lobomycosis in offshore bottlenose dolphins. Cases were reported in Cuba, in Mexico, in Belize, in Costa Rica, Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, and there were several cases also along the coast of Brazil from um, Rio Grande do Sur till uh, Sepechiba Bay. At the same time, also cases were reported in the uh, Mayotte Lagoon in South Africa, in Japan and in Australia. So not only w was the disease founded in uh, more geographic location, but they were also, uh, it was also observed in different species. As I said before, it was mostly in inshore species, inshore bot commos bottlenose dolphin, but then in, um, in, Flor uh, sorry, in Cali and Carolina, it was in offshore bottlenose dolphin. Uh, there were also new species affected by the disease. We found it in Belize in spotted dolphins here. Um, we also observed that it in um, bottlenose dolphins from Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphins from South Africa. Uh, people reported it also in the snuffin dolphin from Australia. In, um, in Japan, it was the Pacific white-sided dolphins and there was also a case in um, Indo-Pacific uh, humpback dolphin. So on the whole, lobomycosis not only extend, uh, expanded in the geographic location, but also in the number of species uh, it affects. Most of the cases of uh, lobomycosis have been observed in lagoons, like the Ilia River uh, Lagoon in the US and the Laguna Lagoon in, uh, in Brazil. They were also often observed in gulfs, like in Guayaquil, in Ecuador, and Golfo Dulce in Costa Rica. Bays were also, uh, you could also find dolphins with lobomycosis in bays, like Sarasota, Baia Sur, and Baia Norte in Brazil, and in estuaries like the Paranagua estuary, Tramandai, and Mampituba. But there are also some cases much less in coastal dolphins, so the Atlantic coast of um, Lagoa do Patos in Brazil and uh, on the Atlantic coast of Florida. So prevalence of the disease varies in South American dolphins between about 2% till 14%. And um, in Guayaquil, we, uh, we have followed the disease uh, since the 90s till 2018, and we saw that there was a very significant uh, increase in prevalence between the two periods, uh, with a much higher prevalence now uh, in the dolphins than before. The same was seen in Laguna Lagoon in Brazil, but the increase in prevalence was not stat uh, statistically uh, significant. In North America, you can see also that prevalence varies between 2% uh, and 14%, and it's mostly in the in bays and lagoons. Oops, sorry. Uh, okay, and here there is a prevalence of the disease in the the dolphins from the Atlantic coast of the U.S. You can see it's quite low, while it is very much higher in the Indian River. Uh, lagoon. There's some there are some differences also in the um, spatial distribution, and it was there was a very interesting study by Murdoch and colleagues uh, in the Indian River Lagoon. So they divided the, the lagoon in seven par uh, six parts, and they found that the sort of part of the lagoon was the prevalence was much higher there than in the northern part as you can see. 
Um, so the southern part is characterized by wood, warmer, warmer waters, and also the incursions of, um, uh, of um, fresh waters, fresh water. So this may be a more favorable environment for the yeast than in the north. Um, we did something similar in, uh, in Ecuador, but uh, there there was not especially the environment that was responsible but for the um, differences in prevalences. For example, here in Salinas, we had the mouth of the, of the Gulf, and prevalence was quite high, 41%. But there, apparently, it's because the high rank male is infected and has contaminated uh, many females in the community. Inside the Gulf, prevalence varied between null and for about 14%, and the, 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 the disease is um, seeded by the low-ranked dolphins that are traveling in the, um, in the Gulf. So the environmental factors here are more difficult to, uh, to understand because you have these factors, uh, these endogenic factors, with high-ranked and low-ranked dolphins. So the possible cause of geographic extension and prevalence increase. So again, salinity, possibly, water temperature also. But on the other side, we have found high prevalence of lobomycosis in water with a moderate and high salinity. The same with water temperature. And it was uh, the best, best seen between Mayotte which is a high salinity and high water temperature, prevalence is high. And uh, in Laguna, it's, uh, preval um, salinity is lower and water temperature are also lower, but prevalence is also high. So it's difficult to see really where, how these factors interact with the prevalence of the disease. Uh, a recent paper by Colleen et al. saw that the wet and acid soils support the most uh, richness of the largest proportion of uh, oligogrinals and also the richness. So maybe this has something to do also with the prevalence and expansion of the disease. As said before, chemical contamination by uh, PCBs and mercury has been uh, shown to, to play a role in this uh, in prevalence of the disease and severity especially. And certainly uh, biological contamination by water, fresh water runoff and ballast water uh, plays a role. But again, we don't know enough and it should be uh, investigated more in details. And so in this case, in, for this disease, uh, the endogenous factors are very important. With, that's something we have seen here in Brazil. The transients, uh, common paternal dolphin, are likely to expand the, the geographic range of the disease with a, a bottlenose dolphin coming into Sepechiba Bay with uh, lobomycosis-like disease. But fortunately, the, the Guiana dolphin did not get this disease. So, uh, the social structure is also very important with high rank male uh, infecting females and the social behavior with low rank male seeding the disease in uh, other parts of the estuary. And so, what happens with uh, climate change? So, again, as I, as I said, we don't know much about that. Know that the geographic ex um, range has expanded. But there was this paper by Nadi and Carter in 2021 um, showing that a higher temperature drove floods and um, cyclones may uh, increase the virulence of, uh, of yeast, um, expand their geographic range, their dispersal, and augment house susceptibility through the presence of trauma and wounds. So, and also, that was not done for uh, Paracoxidoides um, city. It could also apply to this, uh, to this yeast. So uh, now I'm going to speak about one of my favorite, tattoo skin disease. Uh, it's a multifocal dermatopathy that is characterized by irregular, variably extensive um, gray or black stippling of the skin like you can see on 
this picture. Uh, it has been reported since the 1970s and the group of Dr. Gerasi uh, described it in uh, captive and free-ranging uh, dolphins from the US. In 1992, there were cases in porpoises uh, from the United Kingdom and in 93, we reported it in free-ranging dusky dolphins and burmester porpoises from Peru, also finding pox virus in the lesions. So since then, the number of species has incre uh, increased. Uh, you found them in Indo-Pacific um, uh, uh, humpback dolphins, sorry, uh, Hector dolphins, this is a, a picture from Porek, um, Guiana dolphins, a picture from Leonardo, uh, dusky dolphins, that's the one I, I took, and also common dolphins from the Strait of Gibraltar, and finally, this we think are also tattoos in Oman uh, humpback whales. So the disease has been observed pretty everywhere, but not... Uh, in extreme location. Um, the etiology, so uh, the disease is caused by a cetacean pox virus that has been uh, separated into clades according to uh, whether it infects uh, odontocytes or mysticides. Uh, cetacean pox virus one infects delphinidae, uh, harbor porpoise, and the second one, um, bowhead whales and southern right whales. Isolate are from the Atlantic, uh, the Pacific Ocean, Mediterranean Sea, and, uh, and the Pacific Ocean. So recently there has been the complete sequence of uh, a virus from a captive uh, Turceps adonchus, and this was done by the team of, uh, um, by Rodriguez and her team. They show also that cetacean pox virus is likely a new genus of uh, the Cordopox virinae. Interestingly, this virus also encodes uh, immune evasion proteins that impair the host uh, response to the virus and may uh, permit the virus to stay much longer in the skin lesions. So this is the distribution. So the the northern case is in a, in a bowhead, and the southern in a, a southern right whale from uh, Argentina. You can see that here in the America, the disease is distributed to many species and to many places. Probably the place where we don't have it is because it has not been uh, examined. examined. We also found, uh, they, they also found several cases of um, tattoo skin disease in, in Europe. In Europe. It, with Italy, Spain, Portugal, and uh, the United Kingdom. There are much less uh, cases described in, in Africa, with many cases around the Canary Island, both uh, in the field, uh, both by uh, photo identification, but also in animals that were stranded, that died in the Canary Island. Uh, there were some reports also from South Africa, and so our Oman whales uh, there. And a very good study in um, Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphin in Australia. Um, and there are also do those reports in Hector dolphins from Porek. So epidemiology, so that's a bit, uh, that's a graph showing the prevalence in stranded, free-ranging, and by code dolphins from all over the places where there were enough uh, dolphins and porpoises to, to calculate a prevalence. Uh, there were no, no clear patterns related to the host phylogeny, so we, there's no more uh, uh, increased prevalence in porpoises. We, that's, there is apparently no link to the host phylogeny. Prevalence do, does not normally vary with the sex, so mostly you, see, you find the same prevalence in males and dolphins but not in uh, Burmester purposes, and maybe not in harbor purposes from California. There is, this is the, the pattern that we uh, observed when everything goes well. So there is a peak among the juveniles, and then 
the, disease, the prevalence decrease in adults. So probably uh, the, the calves don't have the disease because they are protected by uh, maternal immunity. And prevalence decreases in adults because uh, they have developed their own immunity against the virus once they were infected. Powell et al. also show that association with TSD positive uh, individuals increase infection risk. And virus persistence in the lesion for several days, even months, uh, gregariousness and contact likely fav favor endemism, uh, even if the community are quite small. So we have used uh, TSD as a potential general health indicator also. Uh, in this population, the, um, uh, the prevalence of the disease is high. The lesions are numerous and sometimes very big, like in this harbor purpose. This is a captive dolphin with, um, with several lesions. And uh, the disease persists for a long time. So for example, in captive dolphins, we found that um, uh, the disease could uh, still be seen after 60 months, so which is a really long time. And, uh, but on the other side, in the pristine water of Shark Bay, the disease uh, only lasted four and a half months. So this is just to show, um, so this is the duration of the disease in some captive dolphins. So, and this is in months, and this is the size of the lesions in some of the animals too. So TSD, not only the size of the lesions and their, um, th their number, but also the epidemiology of the, the disease. Uh, it's, it's different when the animals are stressed or diseased. For example, uh, we observe that in disease purposes and dolphins from the UK, uh, prevalence remains very high in adults. So these are the herbal purposes and the common dolphins. And we saw the same in the male, in captive males, so in, in, in black. Prevalence was very high uh, in young animals, juveniles, and remained very high in adults while in the females, it decreased in adults. So that was also quite a proof that there was something going on uh, in these uh, captive dolphins. So TSD and environmental vari variables, as I said, uh, the dolphins of Shark Bay, living in pristine waters, have a lower prevalence of the disease and a normal pattern. So it's mostly <coughs> observed in uh, in, juvenile, in, calf, in, in juveniles than in adults, and the disease does not persist so long. But on the other side, we have the Sado estuary in Portugal that is very contaminated, and the dolphins have very large lesions the, 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 um, that persist in the, in the population. There is also the presence of halogenate uh, organic compounds, like in the Sado estuary and the British island and the Mediterranean Sea, uh, for example, two dolphins that had large tattoo skin lesions uh, in, in Italy had also a lot of um, pollutants. But there is also something different because uh, we observed in Peru that the dolphins there have a high prevalence of very high, so sometimes 60% of the, the population is affected by this disease. And in this region of the world, the dolphins have been uh, really uh, fished for human consumption, and in the 90s, about 20,000 of them died uh, per, per, per year in fishing nets, disrupting herd uh, formation and certainly causing a lot of stress of the dolphins. And so this happened to the dusky the dolphins, the vermeister porpoises, and the common bottlenose dolphin. So with Porek, we also saw that Stress is uh, also a very important factor in the um, epidemiology and, um, and persistence of the disease. Then again, environmental variables. So it was, uh, it was thought uh, at one time that uh, sea surface temperature could reduce prevalence of the disease. And uh, so that 
they, they tried that for captive dolphins, so they increase the water temperature and so that the lesion disappears. So they claim that after that, that it's only a question of uh, temperature. But um, we tried to have all the data in a, in a table and so that you had high, high prevalence levels also in dolphins from low water temperature to high. So it's apparently, at least in free, uh, free ranging dolphins, it's not really a matter of sea surface temperature there. Uh, another study also found that salinity is not um, associated with the occurrence of uh, tattoo skin disease in bottlenose dolphins from three places in the US. So again, apparently not. And in a study we did in 2009, we didn't find any uh, pattern to, uh, related to geography. On the other side, uh, some areas seem to be free of the disease, like in Ghana, Mayotte Lagoon, Malaysia, and Japan, and there has been no cases reported in river dolphins. So again, how could cl uh, global climate change uh, um, affect the distribution and, of tattoo skin and severity of tattoo skin disease? Thermic stress uh, increased all susceptibility, reduced uh, immunity of the dolphin and then make them more susceptible to disease. The loss of free species like porexate uh, probably cause a lot of um, cause immigration and migra migration, also mortalities. And when you have species uh, changing in, in a place, they can bring their disease with them too. Um, and for example, uh, there was some interesting uh, paper about, um, about Scotland. The water temperature there have increased and they have seen a reduction in the number uh, of white big dolphins and the migration of uh, warm water species like the common dolphins. Um, there is also the melting Arctic that opens pathways for disease transmission, uh, like was observed for the um, fossil distemper virus in, by Van Wormer et al. in 2019. There they, they showed that PDV um, affected more species because of the Arctic sea uh, ice reduction. So this also could cause uh, TSD uh, arriving, for example, in the Arctic, in Narval and, and Belugas. So when these uh, infected population come into contact with naive population, they could cause epidemic and possibly mortalities. Also, we have rarely see mortalities with pox viruses. So I give some words on the freshwater skin disease in South America. So these are two uh, Guiana dolphins photographed by Marco Santos in the Cananaya Lagoon estuary in Brazil. So the dolphins were uh, photographed in August 2009. They were adults and the lesions affected uh, between 30, person, 30 to 40 percent of their bo visible bodies uh, and were present on the head, back, dorsal fin. But uh, to the opposite of what Porek observed, they were not ulcerated. At that time, the, um, the salinity was zero PPT, so it was always fresh water uh, there. They, the, the dolphins were, uh, were not photo identified, so we don't know what happened to these dolphins. But when the, um, the scientists carried out new um, studies in June, July 2010, they didn't see this uh, disease again. So it was really, it was really two cases in, in one month. But again, as uh, Porek said, this could happen more frequently in these species too. The other case, it's a possible case because, again, we don't know if it was the same because it was not, um, uh, histology was not carried out on these dolphins. Um, this was uh, two cases occurred in January and February 2013 uh, in Chilean uh, dolphins. 
One was found stranded and the other one in very poor uh, health. And they had also this kind of uh, uh, skin lesions like ulcers on, on their skin. And this looks quite like what uh, Forex showed us, uh, showed us uh, uh, before. This, uh, this, is, this happened in this um, Aniwe Reserve in the Aysen region in Chile. And there, again, they have um, the rivers uh, two kilometers from, from the reserve. So th the salinity is also very low in this region. And now I'm going to speak about um, some other skin lesions in this uh, community. So before 2004, everything was quite fine. It was, quite, it was a really pristine area. And the dolphins were monitored uh, since, uh, for several years. And then um, sea pen based uh, salmon farms were built. And since then, the health uh, of the dolphins, at least the, the health, uh, the external health, has, um, has been worse. So uh, we, we document with uh, Dr. Sanino, we documented that um, in 2000. Uh, 10, 2013, and we observed uh, a, a, an increase in the prevalence of skin diseases in, uh, in Peel's dolphins. It was about, we, we had a 82% uh, prevalence in these dolphins of several kinds of uh, diseases. And this represented a 30% increase in comparison to 2011. There were diseases that we hadn't seen before, pale skin patch, some uh, linear skin lesion, and also a bit more difficult to see some focal skin diseases. So again, it's possible that the water pollution caused by the salmon um, farm industry uh, make the dolphins more susceptible to uh, different pathogens but also environmental conditions like a low salinity and low temperature that have been found uh, to increase the prevalence of skin disease uh, uh, worldwide. So again, we don't really know, but for example, the salmon farm uh, industry, they use a lot of antibiotics in this region of the world. They also use uh, pyrethroids uh, to, com uh, to fight the, the, the losses of the of the dolphin, uh, sorry, of the fishes, and they use some anti-fouling uh, paints. So they introduce a lot of um, copper oxide, oxide in the waters. And really, apparently, since these farms were there, the situation is really far from ideal. Oh, and to to finish with the skin diseases, some uh, a condition uh, we observed with Leonardo in. Guyana dolphins from Sepechiba Bay uh, in the period 2005-2008. So these are irregular, uh, slightly raised skin sores, smooth with a smooth velvety aspect that are present on the back, dorsal fins, but also on the head sometimes, and uh, can affect uh, until 40% of the visible body. When the lesions regress, uh, the epidermis gradually uh, repigmented. And the condition what doesn't seem to be uh, lethal in these dolphins, but prevalence was, and prevalence was not very high. It was 1-4% in the Sepechiba dolphins and in the Paranagua dolphins a bit lower. It, they all occur in this period. We Leo, uh, I asked Leo um, if he had seen that, and he said that he hasn't seen that since. The origin is uh, unknown. So to conclude, there are, um, the epidemiological pattern and severity of some skin disease may vary according to environment parameters, but we don't always know which parameters are uh, decisive for, the, for, for this uh, disease. It is very likely that um, halogenated organic compounds affect uh, prevalence of the disease by rendering the animals more susceptible to the, uh, to the, um, the virus, the, uh, the yeast. 
the increased use of antibiotics can also be a problem in certain area of the world and anthropogenic stressor lower immunity. So climate change may expand the geographic di distribution of uh, infectious diseases such as status skin disease and lobomycosis and climate change by causing flooding reduce salinity and may increase the uh, freshwater uh, skin disease in estuarine and coastal disease, the dolphins. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> very much to both of you for the very, very nice presentation. Uh, we uh, are open for, for questions for the discussion now. Oh, okay. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Uh, my name is Nara. I'd like to thank you very much for the lecture today. It was uh, amazing, <laughs> really. Um, so Dr. Van Bressen told us a little bit of how much contamination and chemical pollution can affect uh, the immune system and uh, influence on diseases, skin diseases. And Dr. Dugnan uh, told us a little bit about uh, some known populations of California sea lions and how climate change might be affecting their pattern of diseases. And I was wondering if there are any data on the pollution, uh, on timeline pollution for this uh, California sea lions that may be um, directly linked to climate change and uh, immune system weakening and these diseases maybe? Yeah. Oh. Thanks for that question, Nara. I had, uh, Preparing this talk, I had to make some hard choices. So I was going to talk about cancer in marine mammals and talk about the pollution and all of that work. Uh, to make the link to climate change is much more difficult, but there's definitely a link between those pollutants and cancer. And so just recently, we've had two workshops in California now because you, you might be aware that in the 1940s through the 1970s in California, there was a big DDT industry, and there was a major plant in Monsanto near Los Angeles, and that plant put out tons and tons of DDT-type waste directly into the sewage system, but also by taking it out by barge and dumping it in the... It, thousand meters or thousand feet deep in the Santa Barbara Channel. And very recently in the news, uh, maybe uh, two years ago, uh, scientists working in from the University of Santa Barbara using underwater submarines detected where these dump sites were, and there's two of them. And the, the DDT waste was dumped as a, as a uh, acid sludge in big steel barrels dumped off in the water. But what actually happened, and there's photographic evidence of it, is that when they were dumping the barrels, they would puncture holes in the barrels to make them sink faster. And now they, they're sitting on the bottom with holes in them, so they've been leaking DDT for decades. So there are those two sites. There's the one that's directly off the coast because they use the sewage system and that's called the Palos Verdes Shelf. That's heavily contaminated, but the deeper water is also heavily contaminated. Uh, there's so much contamination down there that they could probably never do anything about it because to try and take it out of there would cause probably more spreading of the contamination. But the consequences have been that the whole food chain is completely contaminated. So everything from the invertebrates to the fish to the marine mammals, and in the sea lions in particular, sea lions, their breeding cycle is that all of the pups, or most of the pups are born on the Channel Islands, which are right down there. So there's the mainland, the channel, and then these islands, and that's where the sea lions are born. So all of the pups are born with high levels of these chemicals in them, DDT and all of the, there's 40 different geners 
of DDT that they have now found in the sea lions, plus other marine mammals. But the consequences for the sea lion is that of all of the adult sea lions that we have that come to our hospital, 40, uh, 20, up to 25% of them have cancer. And it's one kind of cancer, so it's urogenital car carcinoma. But of all the animals on the planet, they are the one species with that extremely high prevalence of one kind of cancer. There's no other animal that has anything close to that. And the big study that we just published at the end of 2020, the Gulland et al. 20-year case control study, we had hundreds of animals in this study from a 20-year period, uh, hundreds of animals with cancer and without cancer, age, sex, match controls. And from that analysis, the two things that came out as being linked with the, can with the cancer were herpes virus and the pollutants. So the herpes virus was a necessary thing because it carries vi uh, cancer-causing genes, oncogenes. So they need to have that virus with those oncogenes first. But depending on the level of pollution in their body, they can be less likely or more likely to develop cancer. So the levels that we see are, also are very high. So the chances are that they will get cancer in their lifetime at some point. So that, that's very disturbing. And now you know, we know that dolphins and everything else in that environment also have these extremely high levels. The difference is we don't get access to these other species like we do with the sea lion because the sea lion is coastal. If they get sick, they're on land most of the time. And the, if they're in California, they're going to get picked up by a rescue. So we're going to see them. But dolphins will probably die at sea, and you know we never know. But for sea lions, yes, it is a huge thing. And because of all the publicity it got because of that discovery of the dump sites, and then that, came, that happened at the same time as our paper, it got a lot of media attention. And then there was the, have been these workshops. The second one was just uh, in July, and they still haven't even finished the report on that yet. But I think that will definitely point the finger at more research needed to be done on the pollutants and the, the link with cancer, not just for sea lions, but for people, because we all eat fish from the same environment, and we're all getting exposed to the same toxins. So, yeah, that is a, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I should have maybe put the cancer in there. <laughs> uh, the other thing is just in this uh, last two years, we've discovered another sea lion cancer herpes virus link, and that's in northern elephant seals. So we've been doing northern elephant seal uh, rescue and, and you know health survey work again for decades. But the uh, two years ago, uh, yeah, two years ago, two seasons ago, we had a first case of lymphoma in a northern elephant seal pup, and then last year we had another one. Uh, around the same time, same age, sex, age, match. And with two of these, we decided we'd check these out for herpes viruses like sea lions have, and sure enough, discovered a totally new gamma herpes virus in northern elephant seals. So we've just started work on that now. We need to know if it's also got oncogenes in it. We also need to know whether these elephant seals have got these pollutant levels in them too, because we hadn't typically been measuring pollutants in those because we've been focused on the sea lion and some of the other species. And you know the analysis is expensive, so but now we have to do it. So we will be doing more work on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was sorry. <laughs> I was also wondering uh, because of the increase in rainfalls, and here we see that some uh, unusual events that may carry pollutants from continent to coastal areas may uh, alter the patterns of pollutants. We saw an increase in uh, pesticides in dolphins here uh, due to this uh, increased carry. And I thought about that too, that maybe it could be true for the two soups from Australia and uh, things like that, where increased rainfall uh, also increased uh, 
diseases, and this may also be related to pollutants, how these pollutants may yeah. uh, diminish their defenses, their immunologic defenses. That's, and that's definitely a topic. And if you, if you look at the, uh, the very first paper that shows a disease that's like freshwater skin disease, it was from Texas, from those waterways in Texas that look like this geographically. That's what they were thinking, that this has got to be something washing off the land and causing it. So they looked at all these different potential toxins and um, pesticides, agricultural chemicals, and all that kind of thing. But I, they couldn't find anything that matched all the cases. And then when I started work in Australia, and this first event had happened in 2007, which was before I got there, the biologists who were looking into it, that's what they were thinking too. It was because of the agricultural land around there, it's got to be chemicals from agriculture, but again, they didn't find any association. But that doesn't mean that it's not valuable to do that, and there's certainly lots of land to see transmission of various things, not just chemicals, but like those pathogens, like Toxoplasma and Sarcocystis, uh, Toxoplasma just became a big uh, pathogen in New Zealand in the last few years because the boom in the agricultural industry and stuff down there, there's a lot more runoff of, of uh, contaminated water into what was pristine habitat. Um, and then with the sarcocystis and toxa we're seeing in California, origin on land, but there's also other things too. We have uh, valley fever, it's another fungal infection we're seeing in marine mammals that again is appearing more and more often in marine mammals. So there's lots of examples of, of these things where there's a direct connection between runoff from land and, and rainfall and water. Thank you very much. <laughs> so anyone else, some questions? Wonderful speech, and I was wondering, did Franciscana dolphin, they, they don't have much lesions that they publish at least, and, and we know that the, the, the photograph animals in the wild is difficult, but the, the stranded one, fresh stranded, they, they never got those lesions and this stuff, and I was wondering if they, because they are really animals that go in the fresh water in, in the evolution area. Yeah. Uh, way so they they in the Guiana dolphin also they have a, a evolutionary uh, uh, being in the near the coast and in the river go to the to the low salinity in a long time period uh, evolve it in this area so this should be a advantage for them this this two do, do, three species compared to the other one the bird nose the, the more coastal dolphins that they are not used to those kind of uh, Evolved in the, this low salinity. If, he, if if you think it would be uh, uh, advantage for this this species. Did you, did you want to answer? No, that's uh, okay. That, that's a very good point, Leonardo. So, from what we can tell, the, the like the true uh, river dolphins don't get this no. disease because why would they? <laughs> it would just doesn't make any sense. Um, but yeah, the, the ones that are more uh, on that borderline between exposure to freshwater or saltwater probably evolved with some mechanism to protect their skin cells from freshwater incursion. So that would be a really interesting study, actually, to look at the cell junctions and the, the molecules that bind cells together and wh what might be different between the truly oceanic species and these ones and then the freshwater dolphins that would be a really interesting yeah. thing to do to look at yeah. uh, question is about uh, we have i think many toxicologists here <laughs> <laughs> so people are thinking about pollution all the time uh i'm uh, I think I was thinking about the the case of uh, emaciation. The the animals were not well nourished, and I was thinking about pollutants because, for example, for because females have a, a, a 
elimination route of pollutants that males don't have. And especially for males, sometimes animals accumulate during their whole life. And then when they go through a period of the, they, that they don't feed well, they, they start to consume blubber. And then that's the moment when the, uh, uh, a huge amount of, of these pollutants accumulated through, throughout the, their lives are uh, released into the, the bloodstream. And uh, I, the, so the question is, if if you you uh, somebody has uh, noticed uh, some difference between males and females in this aspect uh, of uh, because there are two factors uh, combined in this case the 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 feeding problem would be a problem itself, and there is the 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 the, the problem the, the animal that are not well nourished end up uh, uh, releasing uh, a high burden of pollutants into the bloodstream. If uh, people are looking into this, uh, there are groups uh, studying this specifically to uh, try to understand this complex thing. Uh, The difficult thing for me as a pathologist is if there is no visible trace of that pollutant in the body, how do you link a pathology to it if you can't see it or you can't see what it does? So you're, you have to rely on other things like physiological changes, so changes in enzymes or cell receptor expression or... Um, endocrine changes, you know, so the more physiological things than actual anatomic pathology changes, or immune changes, you know, changes in immune cell function or response or um, not always just down-regulating but modulating. Some, some of these chemicals have up-regulating effects on the um, immune ses, uh, cells, but the cytokines that then get released by those upregulated cells are detrimental because it has a negative effect on the body when you get the, this uh, uh, like cytokine um, overload of negative effects. But detecting that in an animal that's dead is difficult. You know, if, if you were working with live animals that you can monitor these changes while the animal's alive, like you can do with lab animals, for example, that's possible. But with marine mammals, when you've just got a dead, dead carcass to deal with, it's, that's, it's really difficult. Um, so there are tons and tons of papers out there where people have measured levels of different toxins, but they can't say beyond the fact that they have these high levels of toxins what they're actually doing. You know, so that, that's the hard part. So even with, you know, the study that I was talking about with the sea lions and the, and the cancer, um, you know, as a pathologist coming into that, um, my whole focus was on the herpes virus because I knew that had oncogenes that cause cancer and, you know, you, that there's a known association between that gene and the development of cancer. To be honest, I was skeptical about how much role the toxins actually had in it uh, until we did this case control study where we had hundreds of animals with and without cancer, but we had known levels of toxin in them. And then it turned out, yes, it is, the, the expression of cancer is associated with the level of toxin. Um, so if you, if you have studies like that, yeah, it's quite convincing, but a lot of time all you have is, you know, levels of something and what does it mean? You know, that, that's kind of my experience with it. Yeah. I think they did, with, uh, with PCBs, they, they, they could demonstrate some association in the striped dolphin, for example, during the first mobilivirus outbreak, that this dolphin had also a high burden of uh, PCBs and other chemical pollutants. 
So that was also an indication, but uh, exactly as Patrick said, it's very difficult if you don't exactly look for the, uh, what happen, happened to these dolphins. And I think uh, it's difficult. You can see some association, but it should be like um, a, case, a case control study so that you can compare the different uh, population and how they react if you have this uh, cetacean living in pristine areas, there are very few left, <laughs> and then <laughs> how they react to an epidemic, for example. So, yeah, but it is interesting and important. It would be important to do, but it is difficult. Yeah, yeah I was thinking even when we, we have uh, the researcher has uh, uh, a statistically significant difference in, for example, uh, animals from one area had. Uh, had a problem that caused emaciation. Uh, they were very consumed, and they present higher concentrations than in other area. So people could think, okay, then it's a, a hint that the pollution is uh, playing a role here. But uh, sometimes what happens is that when the animal gets uh, emaciated, the blubber is so consumed that when you take your sample, oh. <laughs> the concentration increases. But the concentration yeah. increase because it's uh, you. There is less blubber, yeah. so the many some pollutants stay. They they have uh, their affinity for lipids are so high that they stay in, in the blubber, and and then the concentration is higher. But maybe the concentration was a little bit the same uh, that uh, we could see in the other population. So that's uh, <laughs> a challenge. Yeah. You're talking about maybe two different populations in two different areas, and like the pristine one and the contaminated one. But mm -hmm. what other differences are there between those two sites yeah. too? Are, are, is it a different prey base, different nutritional quality of the fish in these different places? There's a lot of factors you can't control for with wild populations, so it just makes it a, a much tougher thing to do. And you need, you definitely need the numbers, you need the r robust analyses. You need to factor in that loss of fat and the concentration of the chemicals. And we did that with the sea lion study. That was taken into account. Mm -hmm. um, but you need to do that rigorous work to be able to say, yes, the, this particular contaminant or suite of contaminants is involved. And that's the other thing. There are so many chemicals, you know? Like with that workshop we were at, that group that work out of San Diego State University, uh, like normally, I think with the DDTs, there's maybe six or so congeners that people over, over the decades have been testing for. And this group, when a Lowe's group, uh, she now is looking at like 45 or 46 different congeners, some of which had never been looked at before, but some of them are very high in these dolphins and uh, sea lions in California. So there's a big question mark about have we been missing some of these in the past by not looking for some of these particular congeners or not. So uh, I think there will be a lot more work done on this. And if the right reports written from this workshop, I would imagine there will be a lot more federal money available in the US for this kind of analysis because there's been a lot of alarm in the, in the media about it because of, you know this is all, you're talking about Southern California, the Los Angeles and Hollywood and rock stars and movie stars, you know, they, they're all up in arms about this, and they're, you know, it's on their doorstep, so um, there will be a lot more money, I think, put into this kind of research, and, you know, with the, might make it easier to uh, do the big studies that are needed now to do that. We'll see. Hi, uh, my question is about the pathogens that we, we nowadays we have a, a small, a crescent uh, concern about the pathogens that may be trapped in ice caps mm -hmm. and with climate change and also the melting of, of these ice caps, the, these pathogens may leak to our environment, and my question is about uh, what pathogens you think 
might be of greater concern for marine mammals. Oh. Oh. That's, that's, Future that's trends. Yeah. No. <laughs> oh, wow, I don't know. I, I think it's more concern from human being, maybe, because yeah. there were dead people with smallpox uh, that were dead there yeah. and in, in the eyes and with yeah. the flu and pox virus are very resistant. So if I had one concern, that would be the small pox virus, really. I think maybe influenza too, but influenza is not so robust as is a pox virus. Pox virus yeah, yeah, pox yeah. virus is really, I mean, that would be my, my big worry personally. For, for the dolphins and pinnipeds, yeah. I don't really know because they are at sea, so they are not trapped in to the sea, and, but it's more for the human being, I think, that this uh, mm, climate change in the Arctic is dangerous on mm. the point of view of uh, uh, yeah. viruses and bacteria, I think. I, I don't know yeah. what you think. Yeah, I honestly can't think of anything that would have been trapped in the ice that would now be a threat to marine mammals. No. I think the biggest threat actually is more pathogens that are from lower latitudes, you know, like from the temperate areas of the world now getting into the Arctic. So it's sort of like a situation that happened like here in the Americas in the 1400s when Europeans started coming over here with their colds and flus and measles to people who never had that before. So it, it's the same thing. It's all these species from southern latitudes now coming up to the Arctic and mixing with Arctic species who never had contact with Mobili virus or um, lots of the bacteria, the vibrios and stuff that were in southern latitudes that are now getting into the Arctic that weren't there before. I think that's probably its biggest threat, in my opinion, anyway. I, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. I have just been informed that we, we will need to to <laughs> to finish everything oh, okay. to close the auditorium, and I would like uh, one more time to to thank you both of you very much for for your kindness to to having accept our invitation and having come in here to to give this this very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you.